Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing the study of the book of John. And I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, beginning with chapter 20, verse 1. If you have not seen the previous videos on this study, uh, I really hope you will go back and watch this from the very beginning, because the book of John... I believe is the most important book of the whole Bible. Now, I'm a KJV firstist, so I will read it first in the KJV, and I may look at it also in uh, the Amplified translation. Sometimes I find it helpful to look at another translation, and the Amplified is my uh, preferred uh, alternate to the KJV because it's it's kind of a combination of a uh, a translation and a commentary kind of mixed together. So let's begin. Chapter 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre. We know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. It's interesting when you read the, um, the other gospel accounts. Uh, you know, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the, in the other accounts, when they discuss this, um, this uh, scene, of uh, first discovering the the empty tomb um, it's it's really interesting the the variety of details you you need to read them all to really get the the complete picture of what's going on here but um the the interesting thing is here that Mary Magdalene is the first one to discover the tomb is empty of course the uh, uh the guards of the tomb were the first ones to witness uh, the opening of the tomb. Uh, but they're not there. They fled uh, because an angel uh, rolled, appeared and rolled the, uh, the stone away. Uh, now, there's nothing in there in the scriptures or anywhere else that says that the, the guards witnessed the Jesus leaving the tomb. But uh, there certainly is uh, information about uh, the guards witnessing and seeing an angel appear to them, and they, they, they fled. Now, I'm going to read these first few verses here in the Amplified. Let's see how it stayed there. Uh, now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw the stone already removed from the groove across the entrance of the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple John, whom Jesus loved and esteemed, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So she's making a lot of assumptions. Uh, first of all, there's, there's nothing here indicating she has even gone inside the tomb to see that uh, Jesus' body has been removed. It, it just says that uh, 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 she seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Um, so, but when she explains it to um, Simon Peter and the other disciple, then, which is John, um, she explains a little bit more, okay, more than what we get from the first verse. She's saying that his body's been removed and she, they, they don't know where his body was taken. So these are assumptions on her part. Now let's go to verse, uh, verse 3 in the KJV. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. Um, I think in one of the other gospel accounts it says that um, John... They kind of raced there, and John was faster, and he got there first. Uh, it says, oh, verse 4, So they ran both together, and the other disciple did, oh, here it is. 
It's the next verse. So they ran both together. Uh, and the other disciple, when it says the other disciple, it's John speaking about himself. See, John is the other uh, apostle that is the, the writer of the Gospel of John. So when he refers to the other disciple, uh, rather than mentioning his name, that's how the way he phrases it. So they ran both together, Peter and John, and the other... And, and, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. So he looked inside, saw that the body of Jesus was not there, but the, the, the linen clothing that his body was wrapped in was still there. Um, I have to read that in the Amplified. Um, it says, so Peter and the other disciple left, and they were going to the tomb, and the two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and arrived at the tomb first. Stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings neatly lying there, but he did not go in. All right. Now, verse 6 in the KJV. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher. Again, just all these, uh, over and over again, we see these cases where Peter is the one that uh, always takes the initiative. Uh, it's just his personality. He's very assertive. And uh, um, now, then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. So what, can, what are we supposed to gather from that information there? That uh, the, uh, I know that if you, if you read books like More Than a Carpenter, evidence that demands a verdict, uh, the case for Christ, the case for the resurrection. There's a lot of books that uh, that go into great detail explaining the significance of every part part of this. And uh, I, I'm not going to try to explain uh, the, the great uh, hidden meanings behind everything here. But the point is, the clothing is there, but his the cloth that covered his face is set aside. The, it was called the napkin that was about his head. It was not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Let's see that in the Amplified. Stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings neatly lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came up following him and went into the tomb and saw the linen wrappings neatly lying there. And the burial face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the other uh, linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple, oh, let me go back to the KJV for first eight. Uh, uh, verse eight, then went in also that other disciple, that, that was John, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Saw and believed. Now, what did he believe? Well, he believed the body was gone. He saw with his own eyes. Are we to assume then that uh, he uh, he believed that there's a resurrection? Well, I yeah, the never very next verse says that. Um, for then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So it says they, for as yet, they did not know uh, the scripture. They did not know about the scripture, about the resurrection. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Uh, there are so many things that Jesus said that seem to like um, go in one ear and out the other ear of the, the apostles. Over and over again, Jesus 
foretold or prophesied about his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, and these things are all so written in the Old Testament. Um, uh, and yet the apostles seem to be either ignorant of the, some of these prophecies, and even in Jesus' own words, they seem to either just not be paying attention or ignore it or maybe not want to face reality uh, that uh, when he was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's read this in the Amplified. Uh, verse 8, so the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went in too, and he saw the wrappings and the face cloth and believed without any doubt that Jesus had risen from the dead. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back again to their own homes. So it's a little confusing because on one hand it's saying that he did believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. And in the very next verse it says, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So I, I, as I said, I don't know why they, they either were not aware of the scriptures in uh, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, and, and others. There's, there's, there's over 300 prophetic verses or, or prophetic statements about uh, Jesus, about the Messiah uh, that were in the Old Testament. Jesus fulfilled them all. And it's interesting if, if you study the, uh, the mathematical probabilities of these things, these things actually happening, um, it's very interesting than doing the math on it. Uh, it's astronomical. If if only a handful of these things were um, fulfilled, uh, the chances of this being prophesied in such detail and it playing out exactly in that way is is like one chance out of uh, you know ten to the the fiftieth power. Something uh, uh, amazing. This uh, the prophecies are, are uh, such convincing evidence about the uh, the Bible being the, the, the word of God, uh, the, the, the prophecies are the, the part of a, a proof that gives us confidence in the Bible uh, that um, it's the odds are greater than one and uh, let's say one chance out of m more molecules in the entire universe. It's, it's mind boggling when you consider the math. For information like that, as, as I said earlier, you can read a, the book Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. Um, and it, a, a smaller, more condensed version on that is a, is a small paperback called More Than a Carpenter. Uh, but biblical prophecies is one of the great proofs that we have that gives us confidence in, in the scriptures. Um, now let's go to verse 11 in the KJV. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. So in verse 10, it says the disciples went again unto their own home. So they're gone, but Mary Magdalene is still there. And that's when she witnesses inside the tomb two angels. Uh, and they say unto her, Woman, that why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. So it seems that Mary doesn't understand about the resurrection. It says that uh, John believed there was a resurrection, but he didn't understand about the scriptures uh, that foretold it. Um, and in this case, Mary uh, has no idea what's happened. She's still assuming that uh, his body had been taken away or stolen by maybe the uh, the Sanhedrin or the Roman soldiers. Or she, she, it's unclear to her, and she's worried about what, where is Jesus' body. Let me read these verses in the Amplified. Um, and they said to her, Woman, 
Why are you crying? She told them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. After saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus. Oh, let me go back to the KJV for verse 14. Verse 14 in the KJV. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back. So up to this point, she's speaking to these two angels inside the tomb. And then it says, And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Uh, this happens also on the road to Emmaus, where Jesus has this conversation with two disciples. And, and it's, a, it's a lengthy conversation where Jesus does uh, goes through all the Old Testament scriptures that were prophetic about, about him. And uh, all this time, they, they don't even know that they're talking to Jesus. It seems that he, he either um, uh, doesn't allow them to see who he is, or he's, he purposely changes his appearance so they don't recognize him. And at some point, uh, his identity is revealed uh, to, to them. So they, and the same thing is, is happening here. She's speaking to Jesus. She sees Jesus standing there, but she doesn't know it's him. Verse 15, Jesus saith unto her, uh, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him thence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Now, I've, I've heard some theory that when she's this first uh, uh, sighting of, of Jesus and conversation with Jesus here with Mary Magdalene. Uh, a possible explanation is that she's she turns and looks at Jesus and there's the sun, the morning sunlight uh, is is behind him and she sees a let's say a kind of a silhouette but she can't see clearly because the sun is in her eyes. And so she's assuming that this is the gardener and that's why she can't see clearly that it's Jesus. These are this is one of many different speculations on on why she doesn't recognize him. Um, I'm inclined to believe that Jesus is purposely uh, um, maybe like in science fiction the the idea of a shapeshifter. He just he just doesn't uh, allow his his, um, his appearance to be uh, seen. Uh, either, either it's a trick on her mind he's playing, or he actually changes his appearance so it doesn't appear to be him. Um, we can't really say for sure why uh, he's not recognized initially by Mary Magdalene and on by these people in uh, the road to Emmaus. Uh, let me read these verses in the Amplified. Uh, Verse 14, after saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you crying? For whom are you looking? Supposing that he was the gardener, she replied, sir, if you are the one who has carried him away from here, tell me where you have put him and I will take him away. Now, verse 16 in the KJV. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. So at this point, when he says her name, Mary, is it because uh, she she recognizes him because this, when he says Mary, he, he, is, he allows her to recognize him. Or maybe he's moved or she's moved so the sunlight's not in her eyes. Or perhaps she recognizes his voice when he, when he says her name. But at this moment, she realizes it is Jesus. And she says, Rabboni, which is, I think, another way of saying rabbi or teacher. Oh, it says Rabboni, which is to say master. Uh, Verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. 
So, a lot of thing, interesting things are happening here. Uh, for some reason, he doesn't want to be touched. Um, maybe this goes along with uh, Judaism as far as um, uh, the, the idea of being, um, what is the word? Uh, purified. Uh, you know, he's, he, he's in this pure resurrected state and he must maintain this state without having been contaminated with human touch, with the human contamination. Uh, uh, that he cannot have any human contact until he goes, ascends. Uh, or, or this is not the ascension happening, but uh, it, it seems that he's going to be go with, to be with the Father, but that's not the actual ascension that happens 40 days later where he ascends and he's in heaven still. Um, uh, waiting for, for him to uh, have the second coming. So, it's interesting how we, we talk about all these comings and goings, uh, and that uh, in the, there are pre-incarnation appearances of Jesus. These are called Christophanies. Um, and sometimes, People think that it's not Jesus in, in the pre-incarnation of Christ, but it's it's God the Father. And in these cases, people would call it a theophany. Um, for example, when God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, it's uh, anthropomorphized. It's, it says he walked. So we have to believe that he, by walking, he must have legs. So he has a human form. Was well, this... Jesus Christ, uh, before his incarnation, walking in the garden, that would be a Christophany. Uh, or is it the Father walking, and that would be a Theophany. So these these appearances of, of God, of, of God uh, interacting with man are numerous uh, before the incarnation. Um, but then you also have the, um, uh, the incarnation. So... Uh, you could you call that the first we would think of that as the first coming of Jesus he's born God manifest in the flesh the Son of God Jesus Christ born of the Virgin Mary this is the first coming his his birth his life his ministry and his death and then so what is the second coming um, that we most people think of the second coming as his coming at the end of the world and uh, the resurrection. Uh, but uh, the resurrection, we're not this resurrection where Jesus is raised from the dead here, but the resurrection of the just and the unjust at the end of time, where Jesus raises us all and uh, gets ready to establish uh, eternity. But uh, uh, you could also say that the second coming is the resurrection. So Jesus is born and lives, and then he dies, and then he's resurrected. That is, in a way, a second coming. But it's not the it's not the actual second coming that when we see the term second coming, uh, we think of it as him coming uh, in the end, in the end of the world. Um, but in fact, his resurrection is a second coming. And then him coming again uh, is, is referred to as the second coming, but it's really a third coming. Um, now, um, so he's, and then the ascension, um, after his 40 days uh, of walking among the, uh, uh, the apostles and his disciples, among 500 witnesses, um, he ascends and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father presently waiting for this this second coming to take place. Uh, so that, that's what we refer to as the ascension. But here we also see that there's another, I guess we could call an ascension or a going where Jesus is saying, don't touch me yet because I have not yet gone to be with the Father. Let me see how it's phrased. Jesus said, let her touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. So he's going to, 
uh, right here immediately at his resurrection, he needs to ascend to the Father. Uh, and yet he's still going to come back and appear and, and live among these, uh, these apostles and disciples and make numerous appearances, eating with them, talking to them. Uh, they will see him and touch him, interact with him. Well, this goes on over a 40 day period, numerous cases of this. Uh, and yet this is, he says, this is an ascension here uh, to Mary Magdalene. So he will ascend and then he will make numerous appearances over a 40 day period and then a final ascension, uh, which uh, normally we, we call that the ascension. But, so I can see that there's actually two ascensions here. Um, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Um, now, verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, <clears throat> came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Uh, so she tells the disciples that she'd seen him in, in here in John. But I, in the other gospel accounts, I know that there's um, there's great skepticism. They don't believe her, and they question why would it appear to her and not to us, and particularly uh, a woman. Uh, see, there's there's um, in the Jewish society there is um, a, a system of segregation where Jews do not associate with non-Jews, and there's a, a system of of um, uh, I guess we could call it sexism where men uh, and women have a totally separate place in, in society. Men have a, a superior standing and, and women, uh, the idea of Jesus appearing to a woman is kind of catches them off guard and it, it doesn't seem to make sense. Why would it appear to Mary Magdalene? So this is, in the other gospel accounts, is, is actually challenged and there's skepticism uh, that uh, if, if Mary has actually seen him or not. That's not stated in the Gospel of John, but it is in the other Gospel accounts. Uh, so now Jesus does appear uh, to uh, the disciples, and the doors are shut, and he just appears. So earlier I talked about his appearance not being recognized and comparing it to a science fiction phenomenon that we think of as shape-shifting, where you can change your appearance. It seemed that Jesus possibly was changing his appearance and not revealing his identity uh, uh, you know, immediately. But it also, there's a, a, a phenomenon uh, in science fiction where you have uh, the ability to, to transport yourself and, and uh, make your body appear like in Star Trek when they, they, they beam you up. Uh, you're, the molecules of your body are disassembled, transported, and reassembled in a different location. And, uh, of course, that's, that may be a, a picture of or a possible means by which God will do in, um, uh, the resurrection. I mean, after all, if, if you have people who are, are dead and their bodies are either cremated or decayed in the, in the graves or rotting in the oceans and, and, uh, there's nothing really left. Well, how are they going to be made whole again with a bodily resurrection? Uh, well, God has the formula. He has the DNA. Maybe will he actually assemble the actual molecules that made made up my body? Uh, no matter where they are, will they be brought together and reassembled? Kind of like in Star Trek when the molecules are broken apart and reassembled at a different location. Uh, or will he just reassemble us based upon the, uh, the DNA uh, instructions of making up who we are? Um, there's a lot of different interesting ideas on how this is going to happen. But God can do it, however he chooses to do it. Uh, so, uh, but the, the important thing about this scene here is that the doors are shut and Jesus just appears in the midst of them. 
He doesn't knock on the door and then they open the door and let him come in. And this is a miraculous thing where in a closed room, he just appears. Um, now, verse 22, and when he had said this, Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Let's go to verse 20. I skipped that. And when he had said, so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. So he's not only uh, making his uh, parents, they can see, they recognize him. But he's showing his wounds to say not only, do I want you to know that this is me? But look, this is me. Uh, and I'm, you, here are the wounds to prove that I was crucified and I died and I'm here again. My promise that I made to you of this bodily resurrection, I kept that promise. Now this is a sign, the proof that I am eternal God Almighty. I do have power over life and death. And it's this resurrection that, that uh, transformed these apostles from cowards hiding out uh, hiding from the Romans hiding from the Sanhedrin because in fear of their lives to become bold witnesses because the resurrection proved to them and gave them confidence that uh, their faith in Jesus is truly faith in God um, then Jesus said to them again peace be unto you as my father has sent me, even so I send you. So he's sending them out to testify about his uh, uh, resurrection. And in verse 22, it says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So this is, this is what we should think of as filling of the Holy Spirit. Now there's a great distinction between uh, uh, filling of the Spirit, uh, baptism of the Spirit, uh, indwelling of the Spirit, and sealing of the Spirit. Filling of the Spirit is a temporary thing where God puts his Spirit into a prophet in the Old Testament so that they can perform miracles, uh, make uh, prophetic statements, uh, and, and in this case the apostles he breathes on them. They get filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a temporary thing so that they have the ability to go on this mission. Uh, he says, even so, send I you. He's sending them on a mission to tell them, announce the, the good news about the resurrection. But it, it's a filling of the Spirit. You do not have a baptism of the Spirit, which is where the Holy Spirit comes in initially to a per, as a permanent thing to live in the believer that happens first at Pentecost uh, and then the, the indwelling of the spirit means that the spirit will always continue living in us the sealing of the spirit means that we're it's sealed airtight the spirit will never get out and no other spirit can get in uh, so the baptism of the spirit the indwelling of the spirit the sealing of the spirit these are it's a phenomenon for the believer uh, that is uh, a permanent change. Whereas this this breathing on them and giving them this receiving the Holy Ghost is a temporary uh, empowerment that Jesus gives them uh, for a period of time to perform these miracles and this testimony. Now verse 23, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Let's read verse 23 in the Amplified. Uh, if ye for, you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven because of their faith. If you retain the sins of anyone, they are retained and remain unforgiven because of their unbelief. So it's not that they, they have the power to forgive sins the way that a woman Catholic cult wants uh, us to believe that a priest has the power to forgive our, our sins. They simply have the power to tell them that your sins will be forgiven because of Jesus Christ. Um, so that is the, uh, the, 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 the power that they have is to present the gospel. And it's the gospel that, that uh, is the good news that their sins are forgiven 
and they'll receive eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, that, that's the power that the apostles have, uh, is to tell people the gospel. It's not that the power... In other words, an apostle couldn't go up to someone and just say, your sins are forgiven. And they say, what? What are you talking about? No, but the apostle does have the power to say, Jesus died for your sin. He was buried. And he was raised from the dead. He is God Almighty, and he does have power over life and death. Put your faith in him for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of eternal life. That's what they have the power to do. But uh, they cannot just forgive people's sins because sins are forgiven and uh, the gift of eternal life is all contingent upon faith in Jesus. Now, verse 24, but Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Uh, the, this is significant because, uh, oh, yeah, I might as well just continue. Verse 25, the other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. So Thomas, even though he's got uh, a room full of apostles, uh, you know, saying, swearing to him, that uh, that they've seen Jesus, and the, the, he is raised from the dead, he will not, he refuses to believe it based upon their testimony. He, he has to see Jesus for himself. Uh, now verse 26. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. So again, this is very significant that there, it, it, the, the writer goes out of his way to say, they're in a closed room. The doors are shut and Jesus just appears. This is another miraculous sign that Jesus has the ability to just appear somewhere without knocking on the door and having to enter the way a normal person would. Uh, uh, verse 27, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and hold my hands, and reach hither my, thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believe it. Now, why did Jesus say it in that specifically to Thomas? Well, because he's God, he's omniscient, he, he knew about Thomas's uh, statement that I'm not going to believe the testimony of you apostles. You know, maybe you've lost your mind. I'm not going to believe it unless I see him for myself and I have to touch him and see his wounds. Then that's what it'll take for me to believe. So Jesus now repeats back Thomas's own words to him. And, and Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Uh, so at this point, Jesus and Thomas is, um, is believed. But it took... Jesus appearing to him in the flesh and him seeing him and touching him for him to uh, to believe. But uh, I have a, a video titled Faith, The One Requirement. I hope you'll watch that. I think it's only 10 minutes long. Um, but uh, um, what Thomas has here is not faith. Uh, what the apostles have here is not faith. What they have is an actual knowledge and experience. Uh, they saw him for themselves, so there was no faith required because they saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. This experience that they had with Jesus, this interaction with Jesus, is, is uh, just a fact. There was no faith required because of this experience. Uh, they knew that he was, there was a bodily resurrection. They didn't have to just accept, the, uh, like, for, for Thomas to believe in Jesus without seeing him would have been faith. But Thomas didn't have faith. Uh, he rejected the testimony of the apostles. He, wouldn't, he did not have faith. But once Jesus appeared to him, 
he believed, but there's a difference between him believing because he's seen him and, and, and if he had believed him without having seen him. And this is a distinction that Jesus makes the point. This is a very important distinction. See, I've never seen Jesus with my own eyes. I've never had this kind of conversation, interaction. I haven't touched him, put my finger in his wounds, had a meal with him. They've all had this experience with Jesus, so they believe it because they've experienced it. But you and I, we haven't had that experience. We have faith. We Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping this is true. I'm trusting that it's true. The faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Um, I haven't seen Jesus for myself, but I'm trusting that this is true. Um, and Jesus draws a distinction between believing when you haven't seen and believing after you have seen. And believing when you haven't seen, and God values this for some reason, this idea of faith and trusting the scriptures, trust, trusting this testimony, this good news, uh, without having seen Jesus, God really values that. If you will put your faith in Jesus, even without seeing him, that's what God really values. And in return for that faith, we receive the gift of eternal life. Um, so, verse 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. What, what great, uh, there's no faith required in that, as I said earlier. There's no faith in believing in something you've actually seen. But so Jesus says, blessed or happy or, or ad advantaged are they that have not seen, like me and you, we haven't seen him. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So if you put your faith in Jesus without having seen him, you are blessed. You're somehow advantaged. God values the fact that you are believing even though you haven't seen. Um, verse 30, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So the signs are, of course, uh, all the miraculous things Jesus did in his ministry. Uh, 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 of course, his resurrection is the ultimate sign. And Jesus said, um, I believe it's in chapter 1 of John, that he said uh, the Jews demanded the sign. And he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And I said, are you crazy? It took our fathers 40 years to build this temple. And you can, you can raise him in, th in three days. But it says, the scriptures say that Jesus was talking about the temple of his body, referencing his death, burial, and resurrection on the third day. Uh, another example was they demanded the sign. And he said, the only sign I will give you, he's already done all kinds of miracles given all kinds of signs and proofs, miracles, and, and yet they're still demanding a sign. And he says, the only sign I will give you, the ultimate sign, is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And again, he's speaking his, of his death, burial, and resurrection. That's the sign. That's the ultimate sign. This is the reason that the apostles were transformed from cowards to great witnesses at the expense of their lives uh, because of this resurrection. And it's the resurrection and the testimony of the apostles and the scriptures that give us confidence that our faith in Jesus is justified. But it says here in verse 30 that there's so much more that could be written about Jesus. And of course, uh, you not just in his ministry, in his three and a half years, and his 40 days of, um, of, of resurrection time. Uh, there, there's so much that could be written about that. But of course, all, throughout all eternity, he created all things. He is the creator of the universe. And, and he, he, he's the, uh, uh, he's the uh, or originator of even time and space. So 
how much could you write about that if we knew? Einstein said that we don't even know 1% of nothing. Man thinks he's becoming so knowledgeable with his, his conquests of all these scientifics and breakthroughs and knowledge that man has. But even with what we know, we know less than 1% of nothing. So that's, how, imagine how much could be written if everything that God, uh, Jesus has done and, and uh, the, the mysteries of all creation were, were written down. That's why I think it says here, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Uh, this is the only statement in the entire Bible where um, it says, the reason this was written down was so that you uh, can believe and by believing receive the gift of eternal life. Um, this tells us that the book of John was written so that you can learn how to get eternal life and that is through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Um, and it says, and that by believing ye might have life through his name, through his name, the name Jesus Christ, the Son of God, there is salvation in his name. His name literally translates to God saves, Jesus, God saves. Jesus is God who saves. Jesus is the Savior, God. And his faith in his name and, and what that represents, he's my Savior, he's my God. Uh, and uh, because of my faith in his name and who he is and what he's done for me, I have life everlasting. Um, I'm going to read these last few verses here in the Amplified to see how it's phrased. Um, eight days later, his disciples were again inside the house, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the doors. Uh, the, came. Jesus came, though the doors had been barred, and stood among them and said, Peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but stop doubting and believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Now it's important to notice that uh, when, when Thomas calls him my Lord and my God, I can picture him on his knees saying, my God. He's calling Jesus God. Uh, now in other cases, there's a case where Peter's uh, people want to worship Peter. People want to worship Paul. People want to worship Old Testament upon, uh, prophets. People want to worship angels who have appeared to man. And every time they're, uh, they're, they're forbidden, they're saying, don't worship me, I'm just a man. Angels say, don't worship me, I'm just a messenger. I only worship God. But in this case, Jesus does not stop Thomas and say, don't worship me. I'm just Jesus, you know. He's, he says no. He accepts the worship because Jesus accepted the worship. This is another uh, proof that Jesus uh, is uh, claiming that he is God because he accepts worship. He accepts this statement by Peter, by Thomas, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, do you now believe? Blessed happy, spiritually secure, and favored by God are they who did not see me and yet believed in me. There are also many other signs attesting miracles that Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may, you may believe with a deep abiding trust that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed, the Son of God, and that by believing and trusting in and relying on him, you may have life in his name. Now, this is an important way of, of, of phrasing it in the Amplified. It says, and that by believing, that is, trusting in and relying on him. This is a difference between a Christian and um, Christians uh, around the world. A lot of Christians say they believe in Jesus. Well, they believe 
that he's a historical figure, that he really existed, and even that he's the Son of God and he died for our sins, but they're not relying on him. You ask a Roman Catholic, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? Roman Catholics will every time say, well, I'm not sure I'm going to go to heaven. I think I will. I've got my fingers crossed. I'm hoping. And the reason I'm, I might go to heaven is because I'm a good person. And I, I do practice my religion. I got baptized and I've gone to confession and communion and confirmation. And, and uh, I attend church regularly. And, uh, you know, I donate to charity. And I hope that God, God says I'm good enough. See, the Roman Catholic, they, they're, even though they believe in Jesus in a sense, they're not relying on him for their salvation. They're not believing in him for their salvation. They're believing the facts about Jesus, but they're not believing in him as the means of their salvation. They still think that salvation comes through their own performance, through their own merit. And that's why this distinction is so important. But in the Amplified it says, and that by believing and trusting in and relying on Jesus. Rely, I'm asking you now, rely on Jesus. Depend on him completely for your salvation. And when you do, you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven because you put your faith completely in him and not in your ability to live a good life and, 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 and go to God and say, aren't I good enough? All right, so that's the end of chapter uh, 20. One chapter remaining, and we'll pick that up next time. So thank you for watching, and uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.